They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. My name is Wendell Mulberg. I was involved in a structure explosion and fire in 1999, and my 71 Hemi Cuda was in the fire, and it was destroyed, and I wrapped it up, and I kept it protected for the last 18 years. So I'm always a little bit nervous when a car comes back from the dipper. It is an aggressive step. It's designed to clean the car thoroughly, remove all of the rust. You don't always know what you have underneath there. In the case of the Phoenix Cuda, I was pleasantly surprised. You know, when the car first arrived, you can see in the pictures that it was destroyed. I mean, most people probably wouldn't have took that project on. It was that bad. Every piece of sheet metal on it, referring to fenders, hood, doors, header, Dutchman panel, trunk lid, rear body panel, roof skin, both quarters, all had to be replaced. But all of the things that bolted onto the car, after laying them all out in inventory and everything, it was all ruined too. But talk about a really nice inner structure. Rear frame rails, front frame rails, torsion bar cross member, left and right, inner front fenders, the radiator support, the cowl, the firewall, all of that was in great shape. Now that's really important because in an E-body, the hidden body numbers reside in that weld-on front sheet metal. The core support, and the upper cow panel have those hidden body numbers in them. We didn't have to touch anything. All of that was great. The main original DNA markers, such as the front and rear torque boxes or subframe connectors, and the pinion snubber, beautiful, didn't have to touch anything. We have that original DNA on that car. On the roof inner structure, because the firefighters had to walk across the roof of the car, the inner structure, and it was all hot at the same time, sunk down. So when you look at the original pictures of the car when it first showed up, you'll see that the whole roof was caved in back there. So that's the rear header, the quarter inner structure. They don't make those parts. If you recall back to our other season where we were building that black Cuda from the ground up, nobody at that time was making the parts. Now I understand they may be in process right now over at AMD, which is a good thing. But at the time we were doing his car, we didn't have that. So Wendell, when he heard that, being a great client and wanting to help, went out and bought us a donor car that we were able to cut that portion of the inner structure out of. The rest of the car was rotten beyond repair. He couldn't do anything with it. But that little section, that was good on the car and he bought it. So we were able to put a used inner structure with some fabrication and then the new sheet metal on the roof. Once we got all the metal work done, final fitment, all that good stuff, I'm able to go in there, seam seal every square inch of the car, and then start painting the inside of the cab, engine compartment. We put new quarters on it so I get those painted and textured before they get put on. You know, at that point, the whole inside of the car is blue, everything is seam sealed and looks amazing. Doing the Phoenix is a lot like doing the Phantom Cuda. It became very iconic for this company because nobody could repair the Phantom. It was a huge build. We were able to do it. And it's the same thing with Wendell's Phoenix. Caught fire, got, got jumped on, fell on, blew up. Nobody was gonna be able to repair this car other than us. But one of the greatest things about this is Wendell's an amazing guy. He treats everybody here with the utmost respect. Very nice, very genuine. He loves this car. And when you see somebody that has as much love for that car as he does, it makes you want to build the car with that same amount of love. We do a lot of cars here. We have a lot of cars waiting. We've got a lot in process. 
But when you have a guy like Wendell, you know, it, it truly is that much more rewarding. All in all, it's just, it's a great build going to a great guy. My job is to make sure that Will does his job, okay? I am lead counsel for internal affairs, so my jurisdiction is pretty much in his face. So, in case you guys are wondering, that's from a few good men. That was Joe and Galloway. So. <laughs> See, I know old Willie. He, I know old Slick Willie. I know he was going to come in early and try to pull one over on me. That's why he showed up early, all right? That, that's one of his trademark little things, because he doesn't like criticism, all right? What I didn't know is the plot thickened, because the new camera guy, the direct, well, he's the new director, he was the camera guy, was also in on this. They just keep it to themselves. Well, they can't keep a secret. I could see the look all over their face. Judas came in early this morning so he could get the car painted without my approval. There he is right there. Betrayal, which is the second chapter of The Stand. We finished the car off in 600, and I still sealed it after that just to ensure because it's one of those colors. If there's one flaw, anywhere that metallic will lay in it and you will see it plain as day. This is a pretty exciting day. We are getting ready to fire up the 426 cubic inch fire breathing nightmare. Numbers matching engine for? Mr. Melberg. One of the most fantastic things about this car was all of the numbers matched. The original engine, the original transmission, which is almost unheard of on Hemi cars because they were driven so hard and beat up so bad back in the day that a lot of those cars don't have their original engines. This one did. However, it had been open to the elements since the day of the fire. It still had water residue in it. You could see there was a lot of decay in the cylinders. Our job was to make sure that we saved that original engine. So we did end up having to bore it to 60 thousandths over. You uh, racers out there know that's nothing on an old 426 Hemi block, but that is how far we had to go out with it. If it ever needed to be bored again, most likely they'd have to put sleeves in those cylinders. But we were able to save the engine, the numbers matching engine with some parts from Tony. We were able to put the outside of it together and make it look the way it's supposed to look. This will be, and I have the ultimate confidence that it'll run. The first time that engine has ran in over two decades, and the last time it did run was before the accident that nearly killed him. We're gonna do it right now on three, two, don't forget, Tango and Cash, Cash and Tango. They dance in, they take my drugs, they dance out. Remember? No. You never saw it? Uh-uh. Well, I'm Ray Tango and you're Cash now from now on. Ooh, I have money? You can call me Tango. No, it's his last name, fool. Oh. Let's fire up an engine. Now, just in the carburetor world alone, so you guys are wondering what things are out there, how much things can cost, I don't like to give total prices. I don't like to talk about how much we charge for everything. But just an example, a correct matching set of carburetors for this car. Now, Wendell bought them directly from Tony's Mopar, had them sent to Scott Smith up at uh, Harms and had them completely restored. They're gorgeous, like two pieces of nice new jewelry. But they're getting over $5,000 for a pair of matching correct 71 Hemi carburetors. That's just one small element of this build. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is crank it over and get the fuel uh, up into the carburetor. Now, firing up a fresh engine, uh, we have our protocol. I like to use the original fuel pump so we know it's gonna work. Why use the electric fuel pump that comes on the Easy Run engine stand? Why not use the mechanical one that you're gonna be having in the car shortly? So that means the engine has to crank over because it's a pump and it works off of the camshaft. So Doug, if you wanna crank it over without an ignition, I will let you know when it starts pumping some fuel. Let's crank it over for a little bit, Let's hear how it sounds. Hey, 
hang on. I crank that engine over until I have fuel all the way up through the fuel vapor separator into the carburetors and spraying through the accelerator pump system. The other advantage of that is it gives the engine without fire to it, no pun intended, <laughs> without the ignition being on, I should say, an opportunity to build up the oil pressure. So when we do fire it off, we've got good oil pressure, we have fuel, and it should be an easy start. Nothing quite yet, go ahead. All right, we got fuel, great. You know, the anticipation is huge because you want to get this done because this car is a big deal here at the shop. The only downfall to that is I wish Wendell would quit messaging me. He's that guy that I want to see it painted. And it's like, well, just, just breathe. It's nice when you do these cars for people that have not seen the car until it's done. That's not Wendell. As much as I love the guy to death, he's texting me, he's messaging me through social media. Is it painted? Is it painted? Well, even when it is, it's still just a B5 blue Cuda. So, I mean, Come on, but yes, I am excited to get it done, and I can't wait till Mark finally sends the pictures to Wendell, and then he can start harassing Justin to get the car built. It's a metallic, so obviously it's gonna be base coat, clear coat. I'm not even gonna screw with that and doing it in single stage. Who would have ever thought that 70 B5 is different than 71? The 71 is a little bit lighter. Noticeable difference when they're side by side, if you look at the 69 Barracuda I just did, it's night and day difference. But I had no clue that they changed. I actually started to paint the inside of Wendell's car, the actual B5, the only one that I knew of. I don't know if it was Mark that caught it. I'm pretty sure it was Tony saying, hey, you're doing it wrong. And then he was the one to let Mark know, because that's one of those things I think probably got by on Mark. We're at the point now, because I was always so far behind, I would just shoot the body, get the body over there, then shoot the parts. I have run into a couple of times on these metallics where I've painted them, but maybe the air pressure was off a little. You put the, car, the part on the car, it flops just a, it's just a hair, just a hair off. So we're at that point now, we have such a good team, I'm getting all the parts of these cars at the same time that are done. So I'll put the car in there, and I'll put every part in there, and it is the biggest pain in the butt to try to paint it all, but it's done at the same air pressure, the same time, the same batch of paint. That ensures that when the car's put together, everything looks the same. When I talk like side tones and flops, I can paint a hood, put it on the car, and you stand right over it, it looks great. You take two feet to the left or right, the side tone of the hood is different than the car. So it's not just the face that has to match, you have to be able to walk around the car, and the hood, fenders, deck lid, all need to flop at the same time. And just the easiest way to ensure that is doing it all at the same time. So once Doug and I do a basic systems check to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be, not gonna have any weird issues, we have fuel up in the carburetors, got oil pressure, all systems are go, it's time to crank it over and fire it up. Bump it, bump it, bump it, bump it. Oh, that Whoa. sounded good, oh. hang, hang on here. <laughs> that sounded good, okay. Yeah. Okay, hang on, I think it's retarded, hang on. You know, it's very rare that when you fire one of these engines up, that right off the bat, you have the timing set perfectly. So when I use that term, uh, retarded, it's not a disparaging thing. It's that you have advanced timing, correct timing, and then you have retarded timing. It means it needs to be advanced. The distributor needs to be rotated around till we can get it up to the zone where it runs its very, very best right before it starts pinging. I call that power timing. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this stunning 1968 Plymouth GTX 440 Super Commando for the World Wrestling Champion, Bill Goldberg. The car featured a 440 Super Commando and a four-speed manual transmission. What rear axle assembly came standard in that car? Was it eight and three-quarter sure grip, Dana 60 with 354 gears, Dana 60 with 410 gears. If you think you recall it right, stay tuned after the break. 
I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did you do on that one? What rear axle assembly came behind our 68 GTX for Mr. Goldberg? If you said eight and three quarter sure grip, you are wrong. That car came with a 3.54 to one Dana with a power lock. You could not get an eight and three quarter rear end behind a 440 and a four speed, and the 410 would have been considered a super track pack. This car also featured power white convertible top. 440 Super Commando, white longitudinal stripes, a beautiful lower rocker molding, and a two-tone blue interior with a console shift and a wood grain wheel. Ready, boss? Try it. Sure. Okay, here we hang, go. Hang on. Here go we ahead. go. Yep. Woo! Holy cow. I did not expect that. You know, I am always excited as can be when something works like it's supposed to, because it rarely does, it's Murphy's Law. It doesn't always work the way it should. There are a lot of parts that go into these engines. This particular engine been setting for 20 years, and, and right before it was parked, it was on fire. So there was a multitude of things that could go wrong, but it was a pleasant, pleasant, welcome surprise to have it fire right up, a little bit of timing on it, a little bit of carburetor adjustment, and running the way it should. Which tells me that Doug did a phenomenal job, the machine shop did a phenomenal job, Scott Smith did a phenomenal job. Everybody involved in bringing this engine back to life, the Phoenix Cuda engine, did a fantastic job. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> So when you see me at the back of the exhaust system, just feeling it, there's a reason for that. I am feeling for a misfire, a pop, something that you might not even hear, but a gentle misfire in the exhaust. Okay, there's eight cylinders on this engine, fire ordering 1843-6572. I put my hands on the right and the left exhaust bank. I wanna feel if there's a misfire. I'm not hanging out in a jet wash, I'm not goose from Top Gun, 1986. That's that scene from Top Gun, when I come through the smoke like this. <laughs> Going into a flat spin, and then he gets shoved into that, that canopy thing that just knocks the wind out of him. And then they go out to sea. Well, he's dead when he hits the water, which upset Maverick a lot. You know, he had a hard time. It really shook him. It's good, love it. In this case, I had a perfect running engine. All eight cylinders were firing equally. We use the DCU 2021. I do three coats of clear. It's a real thick, high solid urethane. You know, that, that's PPGs. That's what they recommend. That's what we've used. It holds up. It looks amazing, especially when it's all polished out. I use about six quarts. Depends how many parts and pieces are in there at the time, but about five or six quarts of clear. Um, that allows me to do three coats. So I make sure I give it plenty of flash time. Is what I mean is I'll put a coat on. Depends on the temperature and the weather, obviously. Make sure it's dry before you put your next coat on. You know, if you get out and start going coat after coat after coat, that original layer will not dry. You know, and that's how you start running into solvent pop issues, metallic not laying out right. You put your clear on too soon, you'll actually run the base. It's crazy, so it's super critical. That flash time is important. And when you're doing a complete, most of the time, by the time you get around the car, it's almost time to do a second coat based on the weather. But that flash time, whatever the recommendation for whatever paint line you're using, stick with it and always stay true to your flash times. I'm excited to have this car done. I mean, it's great to have another car out of the paint and body shop, but to have his car done, he can quit messaging me now, which is amazing. They can go to assembly. Very excited to watch the whole process come together and actually even more excited for Wendell to get here and have his car back. All right, what do we got for leaks? Anything? Got a little something over there. One little drip. Could it be the radiator hose? Almost 100 PSI. 
Since we invested in these engine run stands, it's actually called the Easy Run Engine Stand, if you're wondering, it has made life really nice for the assembly tech. When you run that engine, you're not just running it to make sure it's not misfiring or that the car is full of gas and the fuel pump's working. You're looking for leaks, you're looking for rattles, you're looking for overheating, you're looking for all of the potential problems that an engine can have, except that you have the opportunity to fix it while you have full access to it. Instead of you put that engine in the car and you have a freeze plug that's dripping a little bit, you are screw glued and tattooed. You are pulling that engine back out again, knocking that freeze plug out, resealing it, putting it back in, lowering it back down into the car. And when you do that, every time you do that, you run a risk of damaging them. So with the run stand, when you are done, you are done. Oh, that's incredible. 20 years since this thing almost killed poor old window, and it starts right up. See that smoke burning off of there, Pops? That's a fresh startup, so people at home, they can say whatever the hell they want. That's a fresh startup. The reason I always point out the burning paint off of the manifolds is because you can't fake that. When we paint the engines, we do it just like Chrysler did. We paint the entire engine with the exhaust manifolds on there. Then we fire the engine up. So when you see that paint burning off, it tells you that we have not pre-ran the engine. The keyboard commandos that sit back on Facebook and Twitter and all the different social media saying, oh, that's bull crap, it's all fake, nothing starts and runs like that. I point it out because it does. It does if you do your job right now, you guys probably don't. I shouldn't be insulting people, that's not nice. Thank you. Woo! We're gonna shut it down, check the uh, level in the radiator, make sure that it's still full and then we'll fire it back up, finish breaking in the camshaft, but, but we're there. We can install it. Knowing that the drivetrain is ready to go into the car is such a relief. Now I can start ordering all of the interior parts from Classic Industries to get this car reassembled. Wendell is gonna be stoked. It's up to operating temperature, timing is set, power steering's topped off, oil's filled. It is literally ready to come off of the stand, go inside, get it on the assembly install cart, and put it in our 71 Hemi Cuda. Look at that manifold. Yeah. Thing turned black. That's that paint starting to burn off to a point where it's almost gone. After a couple more times, it'll look more like this. It'll have a natural cast finish to it. I think you can do a normal one of those right there. Normal. I'm John Howard with Stan's Auto Upholstery. Today it's, it's a 68 Roadrunner installing a headliner. Our 68 Roadrunner is moving along very nicely with the drivetrain in it and the wheels and tires on it. It's now what we call a roller. So we're able to send it out and have the headliner installed over at our friend's place that stands. He had another gentleman doing his interior type work for years who passed away. And Mark reached out to us and we've been doing cars for him since. You know, I admit that I miss the convenience of having Larry come over because he did for years, 20 years, he came over to the shop and did our headliners and he, he built the whole interior for our uh, Christine and he built all of the interior for our little dead wagon. Anytime I'm taking a rig over to stands, I always think about Larry. He was just such a sweetheart of a guy and doggone it. Sorry if I get go backwards on that all the time, but he was a good guy. He should get the respect he deserves. Now, Stan's upholstery and I go way back, too. Uh, I hung my shingle in 1985, September 15th, 1985, and I would sublet cars 
once in a great while over to Stan's upholstery, and John always did a phenomenal job. In the interest of nostalgia, Marty, who's doing the headliner, was there years ago when I was saying that we used to use them. Martin Goad, he is an employee who's been with me for 30 years. 35. So 35, 35 years, I'm corrected. 35 years this year. He did the headliner and the carpeting in our 1970 Challenger RTSE 446 pack, four speed, super track pack car. He did our 1970 Dodge Charger, which was an Alpine white 446 pack, four speed. Our 71 Cuda back in those days that was a inviolate 383 automatic car. Again, they know what they're doing and been doing it a long time. If all of our ducks are in a row and we have all the parts we need to do it, and there's no glitches, we can do the job in a day without a problem. Usually there's something that we need to proceed that we don't quite have. I know it was a lot more convenient for Mark when he had Larry coming to his facility, but we're just not set up to do that. At the last minute we had to add an inner panel that, that we didn't know was there and I don't think he was aware of either but it's taken care of. The headliners require a lot of finesse. You get a, a pull on them, get a certain amount of tension, and then you just keep pulling until you get all the seams to lay out straight from side to side, get all the, the wables out of it. That's one thing I see on a lot of TV shows when they show a car that's completed, they'll show the headliner and they're horrible. That's the downfall of a lot of vehicles that are restored. John's right on these headliners. There is a skill set involved in this. I've seen many cars at car shows where the headliner is loose, usually on an inside corner, like where it meets the sail panels at the back, it's loose, because they couldn't figure out how to get it tight there and not too tight somewhere else. Stands make sure they're perfect every time. I'm just about to wrap up this installation on this headliner on this 68 GTX. It's looking really good. The lines running from side to side are smooth when you look at them. There's no wavels in those, and there's no wrinkles in the headliner. The material should all be laying smooth, even though it's contoured. The trick to that is the tension that you pull onto it. It just, it just takes finesse and patience. So when it comes to the undercoating, stuff goes everywhere. You don't need to mask the whole car off, but do I really want to have to try to wipe it off fresh paint? No. So I just mask the whole entire car off. Mark likes it when I spray it, that I goop it on there and make it look horrible because that's what factory did. I have a hard time with that because we replaced so much on the car, floors, trunk floors, extensions. I like to do one good coat so that way you can look underneath the car and see the work that we did. We're not trying to hide anything. And I've done most of them that way because Mark wasn't around when I did it. We mask off the torque boxes because when the lift goes underneath the car, it'll smear because it takes a while to dry. So I just mask off four little pads, so to speak. So when they put it on a lift, it stays clean. So when it comes off the lift, I just go back and touch up a little areas because the process does take, honestly, about a week or two to fully dry and we don't have that kind of time, so we found it's easier just to mask those little four spots off and get working. The car is in assembly. We're, we're at the final stretch of getting this car done. I wish he wouldn't get updates on the car. Mark loves posting pictures. The second something is done, I learned more on Twitter about this company than I do from the owner directly. So I wish he would just chill so we could actually give him a reveal without seeing it. But that being said, I am excited. So my job as QC is to make sure the car goes to the shop as smoothly as possible. So that means the car needs to go through disassembly to the dipper, back from the dipper, to metalwork, to the mudroom, and then over to Will. And then on top of that, we wanna make sure that the drivetrain is ready to go in after Will's done painting it, or else that's time we're losing as well. So having a good team on your side and making sure you guys are in sync is so important. I'm excited to get Wendell down here. He looks for reasons to come down here. He'll come down here just to say hi. He'll drive five hours and say, hey guys. Hey, hey Wendell, what you doing, bud? Nothing, he's in the area. Don't worry, that's, you're not in the area. You drove down here for a reason. What just let us get your car done. But I am excited to get the car done and get him behind the wheel of it.
In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this beautiful 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona for Uncle Fester from the Adams Family. To her faults, this car left the factory with a 440 Magnum. If you think you remember the car, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. Welcome back, my ghouls. How did you do on that one? Do you remember this car? True or false? Cue Ball Morton's 1969 Charger Daytona had a 440 Magnum in it. If you said true, congratulations, and thanks for watching and being a faithful fan for so many years. That's right, this car had a 440 Magnum with a 727 Torque Flight Automatic on the floor with console. It also was R4 Red. It featured a white interior, white Daytona stripe, white wing. And when it was all over and said and done, the best part of this build was saying sayonara to Chrome Dome himself. It's really great to be back around these cars, especially when I get to install a drivetrain into a Hemi Cuda. How many people can say that? I love it when Royal pops in to help us do one of these installs on these cars because uh, it's really great for Mark and I to be able to reminisce the three of us again and talk over old times. We really have a good time working together after all these years. So today we are installing the drivetrain in our 1971 Hemi Cuda for Mr. Wendell Malmberg. This is our B5 Blue 71 Hemi Cuda automatic. You guys excited? Mm-hmm, yeah. Dougie and I recently got the engine running and it ran beautiful. In this case, we did leave the fan off that we normally put on because stuffing a 426 Hemi in a Cuda is already a little tight. So we left a few things off that might make life a little bit easier. Should have seen earlier today. I bought a 1972 Boltaco 125 Persane that we had when we were kids. Uh, anyway, we got it running. Royal almost died. So that was fun. That was fine. Good memories, good memories. I think it's really cool that my dad gets to work with his best friends again. I mean, not very many people can say that they're still friends with the people that they grew up with. But on the other hand, I worry about my dad a little bit because when they all get together, they all feed off of each other and they still act like they're 15. So you never know what's gonna happen or who's gonna get hurt or if we're gonna have to take a trip to urgent care. You just, you never know. Dougie, you was too scared. He was too scared. A S C A. R-E-D, E-D, -E a scared to, to write it, right? Uh, no, no, that, no. Yeah, I'll tell you why, because the last time we got him something, I bought him a, a nice little unicycle like he had <laughs> when he was a kid, a Schwinn unicycle. He was on it for eight seconds before he went down. Broke That's, his face. When was that? I oh, missed yeah, that. It was like six months ago. We got, we got it on video. Yeah. I'll watch that. That's because he decided to take a phone call on his cell phone in the middle of riding the unicycle for the first time in 50 years. Anyway. The three amigos sailing again. Here we go. Let's install an engine, a transmission, and a what? 71 Cuda. What size engine? 426. How many horsepower? 425. Who's going to drive you home tonight? Let's do this thing. Well, they call the 426 Hemi the elephant for a reason because the heads are so wide on this thing. My biggest fear every time is getting this huge engine up in between these fender aprons without damaging things. The big Dana, did any of our cars have Danas in them? I don't, no, mine certainly one. didn't. Yours had an eight and three quarter. None of the cars I had had a Dana in it. I always wanted one. Eight and three quarters were cheaper. I had other habits I was supporting back then. Candy. Candy. Dougie's had an eight and three quarter with a one legger in it. That was a 391 Pause the Track. No, it was yeah, a 391 I mean, one legger. What? 391 Sure Grip. Sorry. So I wanted my 70 Barracuda to go faster, so I put in a 391 rear end gear, and with the four speed, it was too wound up on the freeway, so I just changed it back. Heading down, watch those lights. These are tight quarters here, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they Man get that wind. way. You got that wrench? Yeah. Yeah. Let me loosen that up. I can't spin it. I need to open in wrench. If I may. Yes, sir. Down just a little bit. Okay. We got the Boltaco running. Royal takes off like a bat out of hell across the parking lot, out into the field, wide open. I don't know if any of you guys have ever ridden a 125 Persang, but when it's wide open, it's rocking. Almost takes out the corner down here in the field. No helmet. Says helmets are for sissies. Real brilliant, right? 
Well, he's got a built-in helmet. <laughs> Bro, you ever see Tango and Cash? Yes, a long time ago. Good movie, huh? Yeah. Is that a Hitchcock movie? <clears throat> Tango and Cash isn't a Hitchcock movie at all. No. No. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Dougie knows one director, Alfred Hitchcock. That's it. It's the only name he's ever heard in his entire life. So therefore, by default, every movie that's ever been made was made by Alfred Hitchcock. Every single one. He did make great movies. He didn't make every movie. And what about old Quentin Tarantino? Hold it. Good. We got our Dana 60 installed. So they're just connecting the shocks right now. Oddly enough, little side note here for those of y'all out there who got to do some hating. That drum right there is an 11 inch drum, but it's a power disc brake car, super track pack. Well, that's not right, it should be a 10 inch drum, right Doug? But it's an 11 inch drum and it's the third one that Tony D'Agostino has seen. Steve Giuliano had uh, an original 71 Hemi Cuda with 11 inch drums. The broadcast sheet very clear says 10 inch drums, but those are 11 inch drums and they started life on this car. So that's an anomaly wrapped inside a, an enigma, wrapped inside a riddle, wrapped inside a Tootsie Roll wrapper. There you go. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? You Three. know? Three. Three. Yep. So who's licking it? A cougar? A no, cougar. the owl. Yeah, yeah, an owl's gonna take more than three licks to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop. It's a frickin' owl. An owl doesn't it's, have a tongue. An owl does have a tongue. How do you know? Because I've seen it lick the damn poops. <laughs> but it ain't gonna do it in three. That'd be the world's shortest commercial. I saw the commercial. Okay, and action. Lick, 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 cut, roll credits. It's like 500 licks. Oh, Basic gonna... stuff. Mark gets sidetracked sometimes. So. Yes, he does. Now, first of all, you know what? Don't, don't try to, don't come to me and talk to me about old commercials, all right? I've seen this stuff, all right? In what world doesn't an owl have a tongue? How does it eat? How does it speak? How, the little owl that learned to say who? Remember that one? You couldn't do that without a tongue. An owl doesn't have a tongue. Well, that's disappointing for the owl, isn't it? it? Scares me. And the idea, the preposterous notion, it there's not an owl in the world that could lick a, a lollipop down to the center in three licks. That is a lie, sir. I would guess it's around 300 to 500 licks to get to the center of it. How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Pop? Let's find out. One, two, three, three. Well, you know what? That's for... You can't cheat like that. Okay, that, you think you're so clever coming up with this? The owl did get to the center in three licks in the commercial, but he bit it. That doesn't count. No, 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 no. You know, I'll write the damn company because that's baloney. I want them to bring me an owl and a delicious tasty Tootsie Pop, and I want that owl to lick it until it's down to the center. I, you know what I bet? I bet it won't even lick it. Aren't they damn vegetarians or something? Okay, so you ready to put it in? Yep. Everything's greased up, ready to go? Yep. Bro, you feel good about it? Yep. You ever install a Hemi in a Cuda? Just for the record? On the Cuda. None of us have ever installed a Hemi in a Cuda. Nope, the Charger not ones. A, not a second generation Hemi. We've done the third generation 392s, and that. but yeah. we've never done a second generation Hemi Cuda here. Nope. Pretty cool. Ready? Come on in, <laughs> come on in, you're welcome. That's uh, looking all right, that's looking all right. Or we need to go your way, Annie? Can we go? I would just make it where you barely clear the water pump to the core support, <laughs> and then we'll come down with it, and then you can nudge it around. I believe this is the fifth 426 Hemi that we've installed while you guys have been watching on the show. We've installed a Hemi in a 1967 Plymouth GTX four-speed. A beautiful 1970 Charger RT. A 1969 Roadrunner. A 1970 Coronet RT convertible. It's the first e-body that we wedged one of these into. How much clearance do you have on your side, Roy? How are we looking, guys? I got an inch. I have plus one and a half. There's no way there's really? that much room in there. No way. You're going to clear? 
Oop. Wow. I've never had this much room. <clears throat> I'm gonna pull a dipstick. <clears throat> That's good, I know better. Good call. Yep. Spoke too soon when I said I had all that room. Uh, we'll can go you down. pull the back over toward you? Yeah. <clears throat> this side needs to go back. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. There you go. I can get the rear bolt started right now. Is yours lined up? OK. The back one is started. OK. I'll pull it over a little. Ready? Yep. How's okay, that? Hold it. Oh. Okay, I'm started. Great. There's not a quarter inch on either side. Oh no, my gosh. It's okay. locked in. This is where we lose our dip tube. <clears throat> Any way to push that dip tube out of the way? I could unhook it and turn it. Okay, I need a half inch little socket, quarter inch drive. Okay, how are we looking? If that actually clears, it'll be a borderline miracle. <laughs> How's that dipstick tube? Uh, I got it bent back out of the way, so it's going to clear now. Right okay, there. you're touching. Go ahead and see if you can get a bolt in. Okay. It really is an engineering marvel when you think about it. I mean, today they're putting Hemis and everything, but keep in mind that the Hemis that they're building today, while they do put out more horsepower and all that, they're a small block. They're the same basic footprint as a 318 or a 340 or a 360 would have been, or a 273 if you go back into the earlier 60s. But this is old school elephant. This thing is a monster. And somebody decided, you know what? We should try to put one in a Cuda. They, in 68, they put it in the Dodge Dart and the Barracuda, which is an A-body, and it's absolutely amazing that those went in at all. I've never installed one in one of those cars. This is the first E-body that we have ever installed a 426 Hemi in, and it went much easier, if you guys recall, our 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible for Smith. They're a little narrower footprint in the, in the opening of the aprons, and it hit on both sides. We had to crank it a little bit to one side to get it to go up in, and then it could saddle. This thing went in with just a hair on each side. There is literally an eighth to a quarter of an inch between the power steering hose and the shock tower on the driver's side. And it looks like the valve cover, you could have put a piece of paper in between the valve cover and the shock tower for gap. So they have the transmission crossmember bolts, a couple of them started in there, so we're able to raise the car up. But before we do, they're tightening down the K-member. It's a really great feeling to see that motor go back into that car, especially after you think the car's not saveable, and then we saved it. It's just such a wonderful time to be able to work on all these cars together and reminisce our childhood together, and we're just having a great time. So all the guys have left right now is to put the torsion bars in, connect the lower control arms to the upper control arms, put the rest of the bolts in the transmission cross member. Uh, once the wheels are on it, we can let it down, get the steering column just put into it right now, mocked up so that we can steer it. Then we'll take it over to Eugene, have the headliner put in it, then we can start putting the car together. That's what you do when you do it. Do the do. Remember the old commercial, do the do? The old Mountain Dew commercial. Looking good? Yep. Flizzum, plasm, flizzoo. Do you know what that means? No. Flizzum, plasm, flizzoo. What does it mean? Well, you should know by now.